face to face, one on one, you're talking to me and I'm talking to you. I think it's ridiculous and absurd, genuinely ridiculous and genuinely absurd for us to pretend that we're going to motivate people to fundamentally change their lives, you know, in terms of diet, lifestyle, and everything else, fundamentally change their ethics and be motivated to work to save the planet on the basis of a 15% difference in their risk of getting cancer. 15% does not justify the hype that people like Mike the Vegan are engaged in. It does not justify, frankly, the dishonest tactics of many plant-based and health-focused activists who are promoting the vegan cause. Okay, let's start with the facts first. If you're vegan or if you're non-vegan and you just happen to have seen a handful of videos on YouTube about this topic, you probably have the impression that veganism has a dramatic impact on rates of cancer, on your chances of having cancer, or even your ability to prevent or reverse cancer if you're at some stage of having cancer. Uh, like the one here that uh, claimed that being vegan cured her of cancer. Uh, sadly though, she has died from cancer. Now she was known for posting viral videos on how she was able to cure her stage four diagnosis through faith in God and following a strict diet of raw vegetables. Um, but here's the thing, if God does exist, he clearly looked at what she was doing and went like, psych, because it didn't work. In an interview with Babe, Liz Johnson, who made videos with her Aunt Mari, doubled down on her belief, saying she completely stood by what she posted. I'm sure she did. Now, Liz and Mari, who, uh, videos amass hundreds of thousands of views regularly posted on how Mari had recovered from terminal diagnosis through her Christian faith and had discovered and her discovery of lemon and ginger juice. They told the story uh, to know in certain terms that they could do the same uploading how to videos like stage four cancer healed by juicing in a raw vegan diet. Part one, nearly 300,000 views part two at over 400,000. Now you're selling lies to people at this point. You are, you're just selling lies to people. You have a video titled stage four cancer healed. I've had friends who've, who, 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 you know, had family members die of stage four cancer. You don't, it, it's rare to come back from that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's rare to come back from that. And to sit there and be like, I did that through Christian faith and juicing and a raw vegan diet is just, ah, so angers me. You may have seen videos with exciting and jarring headlines like, quote, vegan blood kills cancer, close quote, from Mike, Mike the Vegan here. That might really give you the impression that a vegan diet is a miracle cure for cancer or even that the blood of a vegan person itself is some kind of potion that will prevent cancer, something he jokes about in a lighthearted way within the first few minutes of that video. But it's, it's really not a laughing matter. And... Uh, you see a lot of people trying to politically package this message to take these little bits and pieces, little scientific factoids, little pseudoscientific factoids, and put them into a political program that's going to motivate people to get up in the morning and not just have soy milk on their breakfast cereal instead of cow milk, but to be highly motivated and effective in working for the future of the vegan movement. And here's, here's a fact right up front as to why that's not going to work. Quote, vegan diet conferred a significant reduced risk of incidence from total cancer, 15%. One five, 15%. This is a 2017 uh, meta-analysis, you know, peer-reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. And it's working from, you know, a variety of peer-reviewed sources being surveyed and weighed for their quality, their sample size, comparatively examined for the outcomes of their research. And the finding is that a vegan diet will reduce your risk of the incidence of cancer by only 15%. Now, when you scale it up, if you're talking about social policy from the government's perspective, if you ask someone who was currently in power in the government of Canada, the government of the United States, any large country, hey, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could reduce the number of cancer cases coming in by 15%? They would say, yeah, 
and they could probably very rapidly get out their calculator and come up with some rough estimates of how many millions of dollars per year that might save the medical system. When you scale it up to a population of millions of people, a 15% lower risk of cancer really is significant. But face-to-face, one-on-one, you're talking to me and I'm talking to you, I think it's ridiculous and absurd, genuinely ridiculous and genuinely absurd for us to pretend that we're going to motivate people to fundamentally change their lives, you know, in terms of diet, lifestyle, and everything else, fundamentally change their ethics and be motivated to work to save the planet on the basis of a 15% difference in their risk of getting cancer. Now, I say this to somebody, this is with no boasting, with no false humility or whatever. I had to make a really hard decision at one point in my life. My daughter was a newborn baby and my wife and I had just moved to Taiwan. So the wife I'm referring to is my ex-wife, not my current wife. We moved to Taiwan with a newborn baby in our arms. And we had planned to move to one of the big cities of Taiwan, one of the big cities on the coast. And when we got there, the air pollution was so bad. And, you know, I started Googling it. I started getting scientific sources on exactly how bad the air pollution was. But apart from that, it was astounding to us that even if you just took a taxi from one part of the city to another within downtown, the traffic was also very bad. But while we were in the taxi, we ourselves would feel the impact of inhaling so much thick smoke. Remember, this is Taiwan. In the part of Taiwan we were in, they have a steel industry. Uh, apart from the fact that they have pollution drifting across the ocean from the toy industry and uh, coal-burning power plants that are in southeastern China, the industrial heartland of China, Taiwan's own industry, they have tremendous heavy industry. They manufacture computers, bicycles, but just steel itself Steel is no joke. It's one of the heaviest industries of them all. And I realized just within a couple of days of being there that ethically I could not raise my newborn daughter, like not even for one year, in a place that polluted. And at great cost and great inconvenience and with great sorrow and great misery, we had to pack up our few possessions. And that's fundamentally the reason why we moved from the big city of Taiwan to a small um, not at all famous city on the southeast corner called Taidong. And uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful in its way. Um, but that is probably the only part of Taiwan where you can say that the air is clean. Taidong and uh, memorably a small island called Orchid Island. When you get out there on the southeast corner, then you're actually getting into some, some breathable air. Um, and that decision feels, it feels very different when you're not making that decision based on your own risk of getting cancer but somebody else's risk of getting cancer, in this case, a newborn baby, you know, in this case, my own daughter, that of course I loved and worried about. And naturally we tend to worry about our kids more than we worry about ourselves, partly due to their helplessness and the responsibility that's incumbent on us, all right? So yes, now, you know, nobody ever gave me a percentage rate on it. Nobody gave me a precise percentage of what impact on my daughter's growth and health and development or what percentage impact it would have on her risk of getting cancer of living on the west coast of Taiwan in a big city versus the east coast of Taiwan in a small town on the basis of obviously of imperfect but very real scientific evidence I had to pack up and make that decision and move and you know in some ways of course I can say I'd I'd make that decision again now you know the bad news is that was that led to the breakup of my marriage that was the last thing that happened you know and then my ex-wife and I split up she moved back to France and the drama of our divorce, you know, has been ongoing ever since. So in some ways, you know, that's harmful for my daughter. And in some ways, obviously, I was, I was really struggling to make the, the best decision I possibly could um, in that context. And millions and millions of people are making those decisions all over the world. I've seen statistics on the extent to which you increase your risk of cancer by directly pumping your own gasoline into your car when you fill up your, your your gas tank at the car as opposed to having someone else hold the uh, the dispenser, the nozzle, and put the gasoline into your car. And I mean, this is especially awful because when you think about it, like, well, either you're getting the exposure to the hydrocarbons, you're getting the exposure to that pollution, or somebody else is standing right next to you. So you don't feel morally good about paying someone else to do that job knowing that you're increasing their, their rate of cancer. 
But guys, if you search your heart of hearts, I think you know. 15% is, as this says in its you know, peer-reviewed broken English, this is a significant reduced risk. It doesn't say significantly reduced because it, they want to emphasize that this is talking about statistical significance. This is statistically significant. It's 15%. 15% does not justify the hype that people like Mike the Vegan are engaged in. It does not justify, frankly, the dishonest tactics of many plant-based and health-focused activists who are promoting the vegan cause. i got to tell you something else about Mike the Vegan. I can throw in some screenshots of this. I got in touch with him directly after my last video criticizing him about brain damage. The fact that he made a long, and I think I can say influential video, talking about the use of marijuana. And in my opinion, he intentionally and dishonestly did not disclose the impacts of marijuana use on the health of your brain. He talked about health in many other respects, your lungs and your blood and your heart. But in the case of a drug that is proven, I repeat, scientifically proven to cause brain damage through MRI scans... He was withholding this from his audience. And he did write back to me. Um, I'm not impressed with his reply. He seems to take absolutely no responsibility for publishing disinformation that will harm people. And that's what it is. All right? Um, I was a Buddhist for, I think, about 10 years of my life. I had different reasons for leaving the religion and starting to describe myself as an ex-Buddhist. But when people ask me about it, why did I quit? Why did I switch from being a self-identifying as a Buddhist to identifying as an historical nihilist? I normally do start the conversation by saying, look, fundamentally, I do not want to be a member of a religion that is built on a lie. And I can say the same thing about veganism. We can come up with all kinds of tactics that might be effective in motivating people. I do not want to be part of a movement that is based on a lie. I'm not going to tell lies about cancer. I'm not going to tell lies about public protests. I'm not going to tell lies about any of it. Win or lose, I'm going to do this on the level. All right? I almost never say this, but guys, if you want to, you can hit the subscribe button. You can come back to this channel. Love it or hate it, this is the channel that's going to give it to you raw. Abat le ciel.